I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. Well, you know, for the past couple of years, college athletics has undergone drastic and sweeping changes that are transforming college athletics. We're joining me in a conversation on the impact of the changes in the future of college athletics is Bill Roth. This season will mark Bill Roth's 28th season as Virginia Tech's play-by-play -play sportscaster, and the National Sports Writers and Sportscasters Association has named Roth the State Sportscaster of the Year for an unprecedented 12 times and was inducted into the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame in 2013. You can also see him call games for both ESPN and Westwood One. Friend and colleague Bill, thank you so much for joining the conversation. It is an honor to be here. Ordinarily, I am the one asking questions. <laughs> I'm usually the one interviewing coaches and players. And this is great role reversal for me. So I am honored to be here today. Uh, to, to visit with you. I'm privileged to have you. And, you know, it really has been an incredible, probably three to four years. I noted last week that the Notre Dame athletic director, Jack Swarbrick, said, and I'm quoting him, the state of college athletics is a complete disaster. 30,000 foot view, what do you say? Yeah, you know, post-COVID, college athletics has gotten crazy. And a lot of it is because of football and most all of it is because of money. And there is so much money in college football right now. So to, to understand why that is, because football has always been popular, right? People have known that. And sports have always been popular. But in our country, for example, last year, as we discuss in our Intro to Sports Media class, 85 of the top 100 watched, most watched television shows in our country were live sporting events mostly National Football League, but lots of college football. So when we were younger, it was movies and sitcoms and specials and Dallas, who shot JR, right? I mean, those types of shows. Not anymore. Live sports dominate. As a result, advertisers are flocking to live sports. And so the money that is invested in college sports and the NFL is at all-time new heights. And what do we do with this money? Well, if you're a college president, evidently, <laughs> you chase that money. And, and, and so that is, that is what is happening. Right now we have the college football playoff. There's three teams, uh, four teams, three games. And the ACC, for example, will get $80 million. Whether or not a team from our conference plays in the playoff, this year will make $80 million. Next year they're expanding to 12-team playoff. And the leagues are going to split over $2 billion dollars for those 11 games. So you can see the chase for the money is on. Wow, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the money as well because I wanna tie that to a larger issue. But there are a couple of things in terms of the players that also has transformed. And that is obviously the first is the name, image, and likeness. Um, it impacts recruiting. Mm -hmm. It used to be, I mean, when I was growing up, I wanted to be a demon deacon. I wanted to go to Wake Forest real bad, and thankfully, luckily, I, I did. I'm a hokey now after 34 years, of course. But when you now have this name in your life, instead of the college university, it might be your media market. In other words, you can make more money being selective, and also now that's another recruiting factor. How has that impacted, especially in terms of the coaching and all? It has changed the game, also post-COVID. So. The NCAA has been a staunch supporter of amateur athletics. And in many ways, it's right. We have the best amateur athletics in the world. We win more gold medals at the Olympics than any other country. We are one of the few countries where you can get an education and pursue a sports career simultaneously. You can, you can be a great swimmer and go to Stanford. You can, be, you can be a great golfer and go to Wake Forest. In many countries, you have to choose one or the other. Are you going to be a student or are you going to be an athlete? So we've always had a great amateur athletics uh, system in our country. However, as the money has gotten bigger, the athletes wanted a piece. And the NCAA has lost just about every legal challenge uh, to amateur status. In fact, the Supreme Court 9 nothing in the most recent ruling against the NCAA. So what they did, they basically adopted the Olympic model. We don't pay our Olympic skiers, but they're allowed to have a logo on their helmet or a logo on their skis. And that's how they make some money. They own their own name and their image and their likeness. And so the NCA said, okay, we can do that. But we all knew what would happen. 
and that is uh, Bob's Toyota in College Station, Texas, would hire the entire football team to do commercials even if they didn't sell a car. And so it became, which was something we didn't want to see happen, uh, it became a key part of recruiting. If you come to this school, if you come to our program, we will pay you to do commercials. And that's been a problem. Uh, some of the money is, well, it's not a problem if you're an athlete. Right. It's not a problem if you're the star quarterback. And, and for, for many athletes, it's a good thing. It, it, it's really good for some athletes at some schools. Uh, but, but it has uh, created an imbalance, and it has changed the way some kids pick specific universities to attend. And what, what is the potential, if you're good, what numbers are we talking about? I mean, 20,000 a year, 25,000? I mean, oh, no, more than that. There's some uh, seven figures. Seven figures. There's a lot of quarterbacks in, in college football making more than their quarterback coaches. Wow. And, and that seems, but, but, but let, me, let me explain why it's still a good thing at some places. Mm -hmm. For example, at a private school, say a Wake Forest or Duke or Miami or Syracuse in the ACC or Vanderbilt in the SEC, tuition is as much as $80,000 this semester. Well, not every athlete is on a full scholarship. So, for example, baseball has just over 12 scholarships to divide between 30 players. So very few players at Vanderbilt or Duke or Wake Forest Wake had a great baseball season last year. Very few of those players were on a full scholarship. So maybe you got a partial scholarship. Maybe you got 20 grand. That means you and your family had to come up with the other 60,000 to pay Wake Forest. Now, which doesn't seem right, right? We think all athletes are on a full ride. That's not the case. Most athletes, at Virginia Tech we have 400 athletes. Most of them are still paying something. This gives them a chance to recoup some of that. They can do their own summer camp. They can do a commercial. So even the non-revenues, as we say, or the Olympic sports, uh, the, the baseballs, the softballs, the wrestlings, the volleyballs, those kids now, they can use NIL to kind of offset what they are paying in tuition. And, but isn't it still true, though? Those who get seven figures... They're already on, because they're the stars, they're already on full screen. Likely, yes. I mean, right. so it's still kind of, and, and I don't know if a volleyball player could really compete. Well, at, uh, at LSU, uh, two of them did, but they, th that's an anomaly, uh, what, what happened there. It's, it, is, it is the free market, and, and, and it is capitalism at its finest, right? If a, if a car dealership in, in Oklahoma wants to pay the Oklahoma volleyball star big money to do commercials and show up for appearances, go for it, right? That's we, 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 what, what the Supreme Court ruled was we can't restrict that right? because a regular student can do it. If I'm not an athlete, I'm just going to school and I want to make some money on the side. I want to be a musician. I want to, I want to put together a demo and play and sell the CD, or I'm a, I'm a student athlete at another school and I'm a comedian and I want to have joke night, I can do it. But the NCAA had always tapped the brakes on using your athletic status to draw a crowd. Well, those days are over. And um, of course, I'm old, but it's still, to me, it's pay to play. It's still um, recruiting um, uh, inducements. Can athletes have agents? Yes. So let's go to another one. And of course, I think the theme is money is behind all of this, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But talking about the impact of the transfer portal, that's got to drive some people and coaches. I mean, because you know there's a certain amount of your good players and even the second string are always going to come in and out and kind of test the right. waters. But theoretically, I can't get my head around this. You have a UVA star, four years UVA football, graduates with a degree, does a fifth year playing for Virginia Tech. That's not a hokey. Don't know what a hokey is or understands it. That's possible, isn't it? It's, it's uh, very common. Um, again, we, again, we blame this or credit, depending on your perspective, the Supreme Court. Because if, if, if the NCAA is going to say these are not employees, they are students. The NCAA is hanging its hat on that. They are not employees, they're students. And any student can transfer from school A to school B. 
And if you're going to if you're going to say you can't transfer, well, then we better have a contract with insurance and everything that goes with being an employee. Mm -hmm. And the NCAA says, no, they're just normal students. And so if that's how the NCAA is going to play it, then they can't have it both ways and restrict kids from transferring. Uh, this year, Phil Jerkovic is the Pitt quarterback. Last year, he was the Boston College quarterback. Brennan Armstrong is NC State's quarterback. He has been UVA's star quarterback. Um, Grant Wells, the Virginia Tech quarterback, will be playing at Marshall this season where he was the star for three years before transferring to Virginia Tech. So you have kids playing pivotal roles at quarterback against their former team. It's just amazing because we used to think, again, kind of the loyalty. Yeah. Um, and I would also say from a student standpoint, you transfer, you're not going to get out. I mean, in other words, it impacts your progress toward degree almost with every major without question. And so I don't know from an education standpoint, it certainly doesn't do them well, but that's not the primary motive. Well, again, it was the lawyers that got involved. And it all goes back to the money because the lawyers saw, the lawyers saw hundreds and hundreds of kids running around with jerseys with a college player, and everyone is profiting off that jersey except the player or video games. Uh, they shut down the EA Sports video game with college because of a lawsuit because they're, they're making hundreds of millions of dollars and the kids who we are seeing on the screen with our little controllers weren't getting a nickel of that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the NCA pushed back and pushed back and lost. And so, and this has all happened slowly, but it has exploded since COVID and it's impacted NIL, it's impacted the transfer portal, it's having a huge impact on conference affiliation. Well, let's go to that because there's some incredible realignments. I mean, coast to coast now, I mean, incredible realignments. Um, how do you see that? And then also implications for the ACC as it relates to all of this. Your Don't like it. College sports are regional. Mm -hmm. Very rarely, yes, yes, Notre Dame and USC have a great rivalry, a school in Indiana and a school in LA, but that's not normal. Most of the times you're your, your office and your, your buddy is a UVA alum and you're a Hokie and there's the rivalry uh, or, or a Maryland alum in Northern Virginia. And, 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 and we've all known that. Conferences were always about regionality and rivalries were based on that. I mean, yes, Army, Navy have a rivalry, right? West Point and Annapolis not, or, or Air Force in, in Colorado Springs. But that's unusual. Most of the great rivalries are USC, UCLA, Auburn, Alabama, Virginia Tech, UVA. Now the conferences are splitting up and we see Texas and Oklahoma moving to the SEC. We see Oregon and Washington moving to the Big Ten. And I know you're a sports fan that is very interested in the Oregon Rutgers basketball game that will be on your television. What a rivalry. You can throw out the records, Bob, when the Ducks and the Scarlet Knights meet, right? Yeah. Well, you know, and, but the, I, I'm thinking beyond the football. Right. And here, the potential, even as we have it now, that um, the potential perhaps, and I'm just, as an example, I mean, you've got women's volleyball on a Wednesday night at Notre Dame having to play. They, they got classes, they got studies, they got, I mean, the, the travel implications for all the other sports. It's just incredible, again, from an educational standpoint. 100% agree. And I think the college presidents would agree with you too. And in a way it makes them sound hypocritical, right? It does. Mm -hmm. On the surface, it makes them sound hypocritical. And Getting back to television ratings and television money, there's so much money involved in this that the, it pays for the hypocrisy. Or it, in a, you know, we don't have a commissioner in college sports. College football is the second most watched sport in our country, more than Major League Baseball, more than the NBA. Those are pro leagues with commissioners. Someone is looking out for the health of the league, the future of, of the NBA. Yes, the commissioner works for all of the owners, but he's in charge of looking over the entire enterprise. We don't have that in college athletics. We have people doing their jobs. We have the president of Oklahoma looking out for the best interest of the University of Oklahoma mm. and the University of 
Southern California, its president, looking out for the best interest of USC, not for the Pac-12. No one was looking out for the conference. But that's not their job. Their job is to answer to their constituents who love football, who want to be on television, who want to make lots of money, that want to be a part of this $2.2 billion college football playoff. And if, if the soccer team has to bus 12 hours or fly overnight from Piscataway, New Jersey, back to <laughs> Eugene, Oregon, or, or, or Seattle to Minneapolis after a volleyball game, in, in, in their eyes, clearly it's worth it because of the exposure it will bring and the financial resources it will bring to their universities. Dr. Frank Shushak, dear friend, president of Roanoke College, he, every time we talk, he'll, he'll tell me, we've lost our way. We've lost our way. Not Roanoke College, but the college balance of academics and athletics in general. Um, there's still more money, as you know, there's still more money on the academic side. But when you start throwing numbers out with a B, billions, oh. presidents want it. And their, their job is to take care of their constituents. And if you don't, if you don't take care of your constituents, you're an ex-college president. <laughs> well, you know, the money, I mean, the coach's salaries, my gosh, um, raises aspects of gender equity um, when you're looking at that. In other words, I have seen where supposedly billion dollar programs say they break even, don't make money. And I came across a quote of some college sports may be lucrative, but they're not profitable. And I actually uh, had two terms on the University Athletics Committee prior to retirement. And my goodness, it's like, how do we lose money? How do we come close? How in the world with those big budgets? The money, the revenue sports, of course, help all the others. I understand that. But it's just staggering how the budgets are still so high and you may not make a lot of money. Okay, so here's how a college president would answer that. We're a nonprofit. We're always going to break even. We're going to spend it all. <laughs> but secondly, say, for example, the University of Connecticut. They won the men's basketball championship last year. They had 50,000 students apply at UConn, most ever this past year. So their president, I don't know that I agree, <laughs> but their president would respond to you, even if we lost money, it's increasing the image of UConn in the tri-state area, the, most, the wealthiest part of our country, the New York area. We want to be a player that even if we lose some money or a lot of money in athletics, in the grand scheme of things, it's worth it for UConn to win a men's basketball national championship because now it helps all of our programs, athletics, academics, fundraising, admissions, app, all, all those things. Uh, things that our students and our faculty can do in New York. Maybe a, 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 someone who's already working in New York now will come up to stores to teach as an adjunct professor because UConn has a higher profile because their men's basketball team won. It doesn't make sense. It's it's a Rubik's Cube that cannot be solved, but college presidents continue to try to solve it. You know, after all the 32 years in kind of administration and the academic side, all this athletic success, yes, increased money, but most of that was still toward athletics. It wasn't around the particular department. I even had one dad say, well, I got to get hold my tickets, make sure I can still have my tickets. Once my daughter gets out of law school, Bob, I, I, we'll write you the check. That's what it is. So nothing brings a college community <laughs> and a constituency together like athletics. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm not objective in it, but I see it. When we, when we have a game at Lane Stadium uh, and there's 66,000 people there and you see it, it's not only one of the great sporting events, it's a cultural event. Mm -hmm. It's a financial driver for the New River Valley and the Roanoke Valley, but it's a culture, cultural event for all those people who come back to absorb everything about Virginia Tech football, seeing their friends, seeing their former classmates. Uh, the fight song hits like Cupid Zaro to your heart. And, and university presidents like that. It's not just the tech. We think it is. But, but if you went to Penn State, when they played that fight song, you look at the alums, and, and there's a tear streaming down the cheek. And that is hard to overcome. Uh, if you're trying to connect with your fan base and your donor base, boy, that fight song can really help. Well, you know, um, you talked about 
the difference between having sports with commissions and what commissioners and what have you. I mean, the NCAA, that's a group of college presidents who run that. It's like having the fox in charge of the hen house. Um, there's actually several legal challenges about the NCAA. It seems to me that they're going to be forced to making some structural changes. And I know that there is both in the Senate and the House at the federal level, people working on legislation to try to bring some balance or some control. It might be too late, but that shows the pressure on NCAA. Any thoughts about that that you're willing to say? <laughs> okay, so the NBA and the NHL and Major League Baseball, uh, the pro leagues are for-profit um, businesses. The NFL has a beautiful model. They make, there wasn't a team that, that didn't make $30 million last year. Universities operate under a totally different system, right? They are educational institutions. They are uh, tax exempt. There's, there's so many different things that go into it. But, but we don't have anyone running it. And, and, and I don't know that any conference is ready to acquiesce that. They, I think the presidents like the power. I think they like the control. They're not willing to let someone in an office in Chicago tell them what to do. Uh, and there, there, as you mentioned, there are legal ramifications if you even tried to do that. And you know, there is, the NCAA, it's just an association of, of universities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be in it. If you, if you don't want to be in the NCAA, you could, you could leave. You don't have to have a sports team. There's great universities in our country some of the very finest that don't have major college football teams. We don't think anything less, right, of them. They may have athletics, which is incredibly important, but we don't think anything less of Johns Hopkins because it doesn't have a great football team. They have a great lacrosse team, but we think of them for their medical research and their hospital and, and what they do for Baltimore and the community. They don't need a football team to do it. They let Maryland Terrapins try that. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and we have three minutes or so remaining. And before I get to your, to your final thoughts, I read one thing in preparing for our conversation, an idea that perhaps football should be taken out of that. that. That's a special kind of situation and return more back to the other sports being more uh, league geographic and those kind of things. That seems like a very drastic step. Your thoughts on that? I like it. Mm -hmm. You know, Notre Dame is an independent in football, but in the ACC for everything else. Yeah, I never understood that. But if, every, <laughs> but if everybody was an independent in football and played in a regional league, it likely would work. That way, you could have Virginia Tech playing a lot of these ACC schools, but they could, they could play West Virginia, which is a drive, or Richmond, or VMI, right, William & Mary. JMU, even ODU, in all sports, and never get on a plane. You know, right now we're, we're, we're flying student athletes to Tallahassee and Miami and Syracuse, which is great, right? We all have a flight to Miami, especially if the <laughs> athletics department is paying for it, right? Yeah. But, but from, from a cost standpoint, mm -hmm. it, clearly, that, that, that would be a better model. It, it, Notre Dame has its own deal, for sure, but if everyone was an independent in football, and we split these billions of dollars, and maybe the winning teams got a little more, right, which is a model the ACC is looking at, mm -hmm. then, you know, Notre Dame can play Purdue, Notre Dame can play other schools in Indiana in these other sports. And you can, you want to fly across the country and play basketball, you can, but you wouldn't have to because your league wouldn't be so spread out. So I kind of like the idea, but I don't know who pushes that first domino, Bob, mm -hmm. because right now the contracts, this money is with the conferences and they're controlling it and there's more change ahead that's the one thing that we we have seen over the last 20 years just when you think you know what league you're in and what your tv deal is something changes and uh, but at the end of the day it's still great there's nothing better than college athletics for for students for the athletes who participate we still have the best amateur sports model of any country so we're down to literally one minute five years out what would you say as you look to the future? Still trouble ahead, certain things to be addressed, minute left. Challenges create opportunities. So 
30 years ago, Alabama was great in football. 30 years from now, Alabama is still going to be great in football. <laughs> the, the, the Michigans, the Ohio States, the, the, the teams that, that already have 110,000 seat stadiums and are charging several hundred dollars a game per ticket, they're going to be fine. Uh, I, I'm concerned about some of the teams in the middle, candidly. Maybe teams 40 through 70, are they going to be able to make it at the, at the highest level? But the top 10, when we look at the preseason college football poll in 2045, I think we have a pretty good idea who will be in it. Wow. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. I want to thank my guest, Bill Roth, for joining me. Thank you. And uh, I miss you, my friend. Miss you, too. And I also, I want to thank you for joining us, and I hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.